Next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Fort Lauderdale. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Next Friday, June the 6th, there will be no program since many of you will be away enjoying the 4th of July weekend. But join us again on Friday the 13th here at the MAC for a program entitled Crossing the Digital Divide, featuring City Commissioner Eric Sten, Ray Ramsey, who is CEO and Chairman of the Board of One Economy Corporation, and Brian Scott, member of our own program committee and project director for the Innovation Partnership. This program is one of several that we've had this year in honor of Portland's 150th birthday. As every alert member knows, the City Club website offers access to research reports, past club program presentations, upcoming events, and membership information. And all that can be found on www.pdxcityclub.org. Our board host today is Brad Avakian, member of the Board of Governors and attorney in private practice. And he will ask the first question of our speakers. Following Brad's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please be ready at the microphone with your question before Brad is finished so that we can make the most of our speaker's time. And please identify yourself as a City Club member and of course ask your question in 30 minutes. 30 minutes, 30 seconds, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Broadcast of the City Club program this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from CH2M Hill, from Providence Health Systems, and from the Weyerhaeuser Company Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. I was introduced to Mike Houck at about the same time that he was introduced to the Columbia Slough. Mike was introduced to MJ Cody when they were both in high school together in Estacada. MJ went to Holly Hollywood, leaving Mike to become wild in the city by himself. <laughs> he's, he's been a sort of Robin Hood of the urban forest, championing the flora and fauna of our city against both thoughtless and willful damage. Mike is fond of reminding us that the heron and the beaver are oblivious to jurisdictional boundaries and that it's our collective responsibility to maintain their connected infrastructure of waterways and green corridors to accommodate their movements. Since 1982, he's been with the Audubon Society representing these issues. In 1994, he helped found the Coalition for a Livable Future, effectively moving integration of fish and wildlife concerns into the mainstream of policy planning. MJ Cody is probably best known to you as a regular columnist in the Sunday Oregonian's travel section, and perhaps also as editor of Best Places to Stay in the Pacific Northwest. MJ has also been a photo, edit, photo editor for LA Weekly. She's an award-winning art director and a television writer. Apparently, writing a book with Mike has been on MJ's mind for a long time now. And we're delighted that Wild in the City is proving to be such a smashing success, and they're both here to talk to us today. Now, you'll have to forgive Mike. He's a bit, uh, understandably, he's going to be a bit nervous because his sixth grade teacher is in the, in the audience to make sure he, he does it right. So, so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome MJ Cody and Mike Howe. It's true, Mr. Ebert's right down in front here. I had the good fortune of reconnecting with him a number of years ago. I'm really pleased, by the way, to see Ned look in the audience, um, and it connects to, to Patty Tillett, actually. Uh, 1989 was the last October 13th. Friday the 13th was the last, well, the first time I spoke to City Club, we had a brief presentation with Forest Park. I was very concerned about appearing on Friday the 13th. Well, prior to me, Dr. David Good uh, traveled from London, England. He's the director of the London Ecology Unit. I don't know how many people in the room remember his presentation, but it was quite good. And, and Ned, in fact, was so moved that he came up and grabbed me by the arm afterwards and said, we have to do this in Portland, Oregon. I was convinced it was his British accent, actually. And so I was going to ask Pat if he wouldn't mind giving the rest of my presentation today, but he, he, he deferred. Um, first of all, before I begin, I, MJ last night uh, asked me, pleaded with me not to rant today. I've got 16 pages that I'm not going to read. I've got a portion of it. I've, I've got a lot of information that I will not be able to get through today, and my rant will appear on our website at Audubon Society of Portland. <laughs> 
Uh, I would like to thank Adair Law, who I'm not sure is here today, if anybody from Oregon Historical Society or not, but they, Oregon Historical Society published uh, Wild in the City, and we're very grateful for their partnership. First and foremost, Wild in the City is about citizens creating a vision for the role of the natural environment in the metropolitan region. It was citizens in 1985 at the Columbia Willamette Futures Forum that insisted there be a regional approach to funding parks, and I know Ned and others in the room were involved in that effort. Wild in the City is also about an incredibly dedicated cadre of professional land use and park planners at both the regional and local level who have been willing to work with grassroots citizens to begin the creation, the, the, the operative word there is begin, of a truly regional system of parks, greenways, and green spaces in the Portland-Vancouver metropolitan region. Both citizen volunteers and park professionals, many of whom are in the room today, contributed to Wild in the City, the book. Wild in the City is an opportunity to celebrate, but it's also a call to action. To celebrate our successes over the past two or three decades, or if we really want to give credit where it's due, back to 1903 when civic leaders on the Portland Parks Board commissioned the Olmsted firm to write a master plan for Portland Parks. In my opinion, we are living off the capital invested by those visionary park advocates, and Commissioner Francisconi made that very point on May 18th this year when he spoke about uh, Portland's Vision 2020 process. Will our descendants be as grateful for our commitment to a high quality urban park and green spaces system, I wonder. Wild in the City is about celebrating the legacy that others have left for us and challenging us to meet our obliga obligation of providing parks, recreational trails, and green spaces to future generations a century from now, just as we are on the verge of celebrating the centennial of Olmsted's Park Master Plan for Portland Parks. As I said, I, I last spoke at City Club on October 13th, Friday, um, 1989, and I, I sat down this morning and, and wondered whether if the same interval were to uh, prevail over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years or so, I guess I have two more, two more shots at City Club before I'm probably too old to get up here. <laughs> I would like uh, to introduce today's remarks uh, that I'm leading into Mary Jane, will, who will talk more about the production of the book, with quotes from two books that inspired my involvement in urban wildlife and natural resources long before contemplating a book of our own. They describe succinctly and eloquently, more than I will be able to do today, the primary reason we produced Wild in the City. The first is William H. White, um, The Last Landscape, 1968. Among the many incredible things that he said about uh, the importance of the landscape and sense of place was the following. Instead of laying down an arbitrary design for a region, it might be in order to find a plan that nature has already laid down. A regional design of streams and valleys that provide superb natural connectors and into the very heart of the urban area. Where continuity has been broken, the pieces should be reclaimed. Later in 1984, Ann Weston Spurn in the Granite Garden wrote, the belief that the city is an entity apart from nature and even antithetical to it has dominated the way in which the city is perceived and continues to affect how it is built. The city must be recognized as part of nature and designed accordingly. The city, the suburbs, and the countryside must be viewed as a single evolving system within nature, as must every individual park and building within that larger whole. The social value of nature must be recognized and its power harnessed rather than resisted. And I was extremely pleased that Patty referred to our role at the Audubon Society of Portland, working with Thousand Friends of Oregon, the Urban League Community Development Network, and creating uh, the Coalition for Louisville Future in 19, 1994. So I want to repeat um, that last sentiment. The social value of nature must be recognized and its power harnessed rather than resisted. Frederick Law Olmsted, who founded the nation, and the organization that preceded the Red Cross firmly believed in the social value of parks and the urban environment. And again, Commissioner uh, Francisconi spoke eloquently to that point in his presentation. Today, we are attempting to rekindle the connection between social justice and environmental issues through the integration of parks and green spaces, affordable housing, living wage jobs, access to transportation, good urban design, and creating compact urban communities. And the Coalition for a Livable Future, I think, has embarked in an effort to rekindle the Olmsteadian vision of the role in parks for a just and sustainable society. Another favorite quote of mine is Henry David Thoreau, 
His aphorism in Wildness is the Preservation of the World has driven this country's conservation agenda for a century. The emphasis being on the protection of wilderness and pristine habitats in the rural hinterlands, which of course we all support and is very important. Today, however, as we strive to stem the tide of urban sprawl, I believe our new mantra should be, in livable cities is the preservation of the wild. Unless we can create compact land conserving cities, the effort to save the wild out there in the rural landscape and wilderness areas will, I, I believe, be impossible. But to be livable, cities must include a vibrant green, green for urban green infrastructure with healthy streams, natural areas, and neighborhood parks inside our cities. We no longer have the luxury of writing off the urban environment as an ecological sacrifice area in deference to protecting the rural landscape. Wild in the city is above all a manifesto that urban dwellers yearn for and have a right to access to nature where they live in the city. Some would offer the newly emerging smart growth movement as a solution. In my opinion, neither the, the so-called smart growth movement nor the new urbanism yet adequately address the integration of nature in their, in their schemes for the creation of a livable city. And I know Patty, myself, and others were involved in their national conference, and I was very pleased that they, there is a new committee in the Congress, Congress for New Urbanism to better integrate natural resources into that movement. Fault also lies with the Oregon Land Use Planning Program. And this view is supported by Oregon's State of the Environment Report 2000, which states, these laws, the land use laws, were not written to address ecological issues such as clean water or ecosystem function within our urban growth boundaries. Everyone in this room who knows the planning program knows that is not true, technically or legally, but functionally it has been true for far too long. The just released Defenders of Wildlife document, No Place for Nature, limits in Oregon's land use program to protect fish and wildlife habitat in the Willamette Valley states if the land use system is to play a more effective role in addressing fish and wildlife needs, it must move away from this site by site, resource by resource, jurisdiction by jurisdiction model. And in fact, in 1982, when I started my job as Urban Naturalist at Audubon Society of Portland, the first thing I did, my first task, was to undertake fish and wildlife habitat inventories in the metropolitan region. I was told in no uncertain terms by local planners that goal five did not apply inside the urban growth boundary. That the urban growth boundary was delineated to protect farm and forest land and everything up inside the urban growth boundary was up for grabs. Wild in the city is a rejection of that thesis and a celebration of how much we in fact have done to reverse that view in the intervening 19 years. And I want to make it very clear that I am and the Audubon Society of Portland is a strong supporter of Oregon's land use planning program. It has reversed the urban sprawl trend that we've seen across the country. What it has not done, however, is address quality of life issues inside the urban growth boundary. It was this lack of protection of natural resources at either the local or regional level that prompted citizens to approach Metro in 1989 to create, and this took about a year to get this one tagline in a committee created, a cooperative regional system of natural areas, open space, trails, and greenways for wildlife and people. That brings me to my October 1989 City Club presentation, protecting our urban wild lands, renewing a vision. The vision that I was urging we renew was that of John Charles Olmsted, who shuttled between Portland and Seattle writing park master plans for both cities. And one thing has remained unchanged in the intervening 98 years. Neither city, neither Portland nor Seattle, had the funds that were required to pay for their train fare to Portland and shuttle them back and forth. So Portland and Seattle got together and agreed to share the expenses of bringing Olmsted out from Boston. In 1989, along those lines, I said that with few notable exceptions, we had not accomplished the recommendations set forth by Olmsted's Lewis Mumford in a city club speech, by the way, in 1938, in which he urged for a bi-state Vancouver, Portland regional natural area system in addition to the Gorge Commission, um, or the 1971 uh, Crag Report. Shortly before I came to city club, I had run into a, an amazing person who I do not see here today, Barbara Walker, um, who's with the 40 Mile Loop Land Trust. Uh, when I first saw Barbara's slide or image depicting the 40 mile loop, it was impossible to ignore the striking coinc coincidence of the trail and natural areas that, pass, that the loop passes through. It was a marriage of tremendous recreational and wildlife viewing opportunities. Shortly thereafter, 
the Audubon Society of Portland, 40 Mile Loop Land Trust, and a lot of fledgling friends groups that were cropping up around the region. Um, petition Metro to assume a lead role in mapping, protecting and restoring uh, urban green spaces and create a regional trail system. And I, would, I should take time out here to, uh, again, acknowledge folks who had a, a central role, a key role to play in that effort. Senator Hatfield and Congressman Acoin were responsible for getting the federal monies allocated that went to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and then to Metro uh, to allow that program to get off the ground. Today, so what I'm doing, I want to go back to 1989, what my observations were then, and say, okay, well, what have we done since then? Today, the Metro Regional Parks and Green Spaces Program has acquired 7,000 acres of regionally significant natural areas and over 200 transactions. That is remarkable over the intervening years. A few examples are 492 acres in Clear Creek County in Clackamas County, 256 acres at Cooper Mountain, 27 acres at Willamette Cove in North Portland, and a lot of greenway and trail activity. 30 acres along the Fano Creek Greenway, which Metro is engaged with the city of Portland and other jurisdictions to actually create a greenway trail from Willamette Park all the way to the Tualatin River in Durham. Um, you're all well aware, I, I hope, that there are 44 acres between OMSI and Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge that will be the OMSI to Springwater Corps, so we'll have a greenway trail on the east side of the Willamette River in addition to the Esplanade. And then, of course, there's the uh, North Peninsula, Peninsula Crossing Trail in North Portland, a 2.6-mile two, trail that links the Willamette River with the Columbia to the north. And Jim Desmond is not here today, but he deserves a lot of praise for the work he's done in that effort. Local park providers um, had $25 million of that regional bond measure, 135.6, with which they've done a lot of work as well. Um, in 1903, John Charles Olmsted wrote, Enor enormous advantages are gained by locating parks and, and parkways so as to take advantage of beautiful natural scenery. Thus, brooks or little rivers, which would otherwise be put in large underground conduits at enormous public expense, may be, may be made attractive parkways. So what's changed in the past 12 years? Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services has uh, eliminated virtually all the combined sewer flows from the Columbia Slough. They planted 600,000 trees and shrubs in the Columbia Slough watershed. And I think most importantly, getting back to Olmsted's vision for how streams should be treated, urban waterways should be treated, they've actually used uh, FEMA flood insurance money to buy out willing sellers in the floodplain and have returned the floodplain to um, what it does best, which is retain floodwaters and uh, protect fish and wildlife habitat and water quality. Portland Parks, integrating natural areas into a comprehensive park system. When I was uh, in graduate school at Portland State University, Al Miller, a good friend of mine, came to a mammalogy seminar and uh, told us the city of Portland had some strange plans for Oaks Bottom, well, what well, was then just Oaks Bottom, the Oaks Bottom area. And in fact, at the time, the, the parks commissioner, who many people in this room will remember, coveted the 160-acre wetland area for a location for the Children's Museum, ball fields, and some other uses that the neighborhood, Selwood Moral Improvement League, wasn't too excited about. We fortunately lost that commissioner to the Federal Maritime Commission. <laughs> and recently, the Children's Museum found a much more suitable home. Since 1989, much has changed in the Portland Parks and Recreation Program. Oaks Bottom was designated as Portland's first official urban wildlife refuge. And Portland Parks, since 1989, roughly, am I right there, Jim, roughly, has added 3,000 acres of natural areas in their program, including 572 acres of Powell Butte, 1,900 acres, almost 2,000 acres of Smith and Bybee Lakes, which has been transferred to uh, Metro for management, 300 acres in Forest Park, and a number of other acquisitions. But I think, equally importantly, City Council, which has generally been very supportive of Portland's natural areas program, recently added $300,000 uh, to the Natural Areas Management Fund, which Jim, Jim Shalin and Fred Nielsen have been struggling by without for all, all these many years. So that's a huge step forward in terms of actually managing those natural areas. I have a number of recommendations, however, where the Portland Parks could go further, but I'm not going to do them here. I will run out of time. 
Regarding regional growth management, parks, and green spaces, um, in 1989, there was literally absolutely no connection between regional parks and green spaces and the land use planning program. No connection whatsoever. That's changed. And in fact, the same document that I referred to earlier, the Defenders of Wildlife put out, makes the following statement. Among local and regional governments in the Willamette Valley, Metro stands out for its current effort to integrate multiple resource issues and programs in one planning process. And again, I'm not going to go into detail, but the 2040 planning process has actually done what Ian McCarg urged us to do in 1969. I think a lot of planners may have read it and then forgot what Design with Nature was all about. Metro has actually moved forward in, uh, with respect to uh, removing uh, streams, wetlands, and floodplains from the buildable lands inventory and then working toward pr actually protecting those areas. Uh, Jim Zarin is in the room today. I, I added in here comprehensive regional park and green, green space planning. And I think everyone in this room and in this region owes Jim a debt of gratitude for his doggedness at insisting that as this region grows and as it densifies, we include neighborhood, community parks, uh, squares, plazas, piazzas, as Jim, Jim Francisconi would say, along with the natural areas to go along hand in hand with increased density and, and creating a compact urban environment. And if Jim had not stayed on that, that document would not have come out of Metro. So Jim, uh, you have our gratitude. I will say, however, those of us, Joey Pope and a few others, um, probably at the simultaneous say, Jim, we don't need to wordsmith vision 2020 anymore, please. Um, I'll wrap up here in the next couple minutes. A few other points that I raised in 1989. We need to complete the 40 mile loop. And at that time, I made a reference to a snag. Portland Park folks are going to laugh at this. A snag in the acquisition of the Bellrose line between Gresham and Portland. And that needs to be resolved. Well, not only did that snag get resolved, but it, you know, on what is now the Springwater Trail corridor, uh, but 17 miles of old interurban rail line between Portland and Boring are now fully hard surfaced. One can hope, this is looking to the future again, so I can come back in another 12 years or so. One can hope that the state-owned line between Boring and Estacada will one day mean we can jump on the Springwater Corridor Trail on the Willamette River Greenway, bicycle or hike to Boring and Estacada, and from there across, uh, access the Pacific Crest Trail. And as Barbara Walker, who I'm, I'm sad to say is not here today because she's a phenomenal hero of mine, is wont to say, turn left, and go to Canada, we're right, and on to Mexico. <laughs> but first, and this is our challenge, we're celebrating and we're challenging. Our challenge is to, to uh, make sure the regional funding pot for transportation projects provides the funding for that next link between um, Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge and across Southeast McLaughlin Boulevard. And that's on the table right now. And I think City Club could have some uh, impact on that. Wild in the City, I'm getting back to the book, Mary Jane describes this incredible regional trail system, the entire 40 mile loop as well as the Springwater Trail. And I have a bunch of other things I was going to go through here today, but I'm going to wrap it up by saying I think there is a role, as I said in 1989, for City Club in this effort. Then I simply said, I'd like to urge that the City Club establish a special committee or perhaps a subcommittee to become involved in regional natural resource issues. I asked that question again at Jim Francisconi's presentation. I was promised the board was going to consider establishing a standing committee for parks for City Club. I'm not sure where that went, if anywhere. I have five requests of City Club, potentially, for the future for you to consider. City Club is noted for its active role, role in regional local growth management. I would suggest that, in fact, you do um, establish a standing committee. I'm at 20 minutes. Um, state of the environment report. To my knowledge, there is no state of the environment report at City Club, unless I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. We asked the mayor, we asked the governor, we asked the Metro Executive Officer to come and present the state of the city, state of the state, state of the region. I believe we should have a state of the green spaces and park system in, in the metropolitan region. Olmstead 2003, a number of us are, have gotten together to plan to celebrate the centenary of Olmstead's vision for this region. City Club should put on its calendar, I think, a series of events, um, both here in this forum and perhaps elsewhere in the city and the region to celebrate that. Portland Parks 2020, Jim Francisconi outlined the establishment of a parks foundation, a park board. City Club should be very actively involved in both of those efforts. And, uh, oh. 
planning parks and green spaces, making the connection with Clark County. No matter how many times we say how important bi-state cooperation is, it doesn't exist in my opinion, other than at a very cursory level in transportation. I believe the city role could play a role in perhaps even having a joint meetings um, on each side of the river periodically to, to try to push that agenda. And with that, I'll close. But basically what I was trying to do was point out, while in the city the book, is about much more than a book. It's about all the work that people put in for the last 98 years, 20 years, however you want to count it, a lot of whom are in this room. And this is a great opportunity for us to actually step back and celebrate all the work we've done by getting out there on canoes and kayaks, bicycles, and, and actually using these areas. And with that, Mary Jane is going to describe how the heck we did this over a three-year period. It is a privilege to be here today. Um, as you know, uh, this was a, a tremendous uh, project, as you can imagine. Um, people always ask me how long it took to do this project. Well, physically it took us uh, about three years. But I think it started maybe almost 40 years ago uh, on the banks of the Clackamas River in Estacada, um, where Mike and I were fast friends. And we just lived in an environment where we didn't even know words. We lived in a logging town on the edge of the National Forest, uh, Mount Hood National Forest, those of you who know Estacada. Uh, and we had no parameters. We, we didn't even know words such as conservation or habitat or environmentalism. Uh, we just lived in an area that was naturally beautiful and we didn't think about it. And if you could project to that time when we were teenagers on the Clackamas River, um, you would look at both of us and probably reverse roles and say, I would be here in Mike's role. Mike would be doing something else. He was a jock. He was a miler. He was a football player and a basketball player. And I was probably more sensitive to my environment because I lived on the river in the woods. And my parents and my grandparents were the type of people who were very conscious of their environment. Uh, my dad was a hunter and a fisherman, and we just sort of knew uh, things such as when the dogwood is in bloom, the salmon are running. Uh, but I went off to my life after high school, and Mike went off to his, and although we kept in contact, I led sort of a frivolous life. I went to Seattle and became a photographer and an art director and went to Los Angeles and wrote for television. All the while, Mike came back to Portland and started doing what he's doing now, which is investing his life in this city and in these urban spaces, um, which is really remarkable to me. But over the span of 30 years, while I was in LA or Seattle or all over the country and world, Mike was here digging in, and every time I'd come home, he would take me to these marvelous places, uh, to the Steens Mountain, to Malheur, to Heron Lakes Golf Course, just to show me the beautiful things that he had discovered in this land, this, this Oregon. And all of this time, over the span of 40 years, or 30 years, I should say, um, I kept telling Mike, okay, we have to do a book. Um, what I had in mind was uh, a travel book, sort of like Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. And I said, we can go to all your favorite places that you've shown me and then write about them, and we'd call it Travels with Cuervo. <laughs> but Mike always said, he said, no, no, no. Nobody's interested in what I'm interested in. Nobody's interested in what I see. And I, I would say you're wrong, but as many of you in this room know, when Mike uh, makes up his mind about something, uh, you, just as, you just as well better step aside. <laughs> anyway, when I moved back to Portland, um, Mike and I were sitting on the riverfront at the marina having a beer, and I said, okay, this is it. We're going to write a book. And he just says, no, no, no. And he sort of flippantly said, the only book that needs to be written is A Field Guide of Portland. And I just said, fine. And serendipitously, I had been talking to Gary Luke at Sasquatch uh, uh, Publications in Seattle. And I called Gary. And Gary said, great, send me a proposal. And in the meantime, with Mike talking to people and other people finding out about the idea, someone else had talked to Adair Law at the Oregon Historical Society. 
And so we were in kind of a little mini skirmish bidding war about who would get this book. And Oregon Historical Society won because most of the people uh, involved that we brought into the project uh, decided we should keep it in Oregon, which is right. Anyway, once we just, the original idea for this book was that I would write it, and my, we would tromp all the sites, uh, gather all the material, and I would write it. I'm a writer, I like to write. Um, and then we started thinking, it's going to take us two years just to see the sites, just the time involved. And then, he's, and then he sort of said, uh, what am I thinking? He was involved with the publication of the Audubon Society called The Urban Naturalist for almost 18 years. And this publication is a mar marvelous compilation of a quarterly of essays, site guides, uh, and illustrations. And so we got together with the graphic designer, uh, Martha Gannett, and the editor, Bob Wilson, and the four of us sat down and said, how can we make this into a book? And this is 18 years. They gave me a stack this high uh, of the publications to read. And when I read it, I just, it just amazed me at the quality of the work. Uh, none of them, hardly any of them were professional writers, but the quality of the work, because they were professionals in their field, they were uh, entomologists or biologists or botanists, were just marvelous writing that I could never do. Um, so we had a book if someone would take the time to put it all together. And then we decided, which was me. <laughs> So then we decided, well, will these people who have done all these illustrations, who have written all these essays, will they be willing to update their work? We called them all. They all unequivocally said yes. Not one person hesitated. And it just was a marvelous, amazing thing to me that these people would volunteer their time uh, and their efforts to update all this work that they'd done years and years and years ago. And then beyond that, we have 60 contributors to this book, but beyond that, we have hundreds more who contributed their time and their effort and their vision uh, to get this book done. And it, it was a project. <laughs> Let me tell you, it was difficult uh, because most of these people who volunteered their efforts uh, had other jobs and they weren't used to deadlines, uh, writing deadlines. And so there were uh, many times when I was ready to give up uh, the project. Uh, in fact, once near our deadline, which was uh, the mid of, middle of August, when Mike and I had spent maybe six weeks um, emailing each other, this was mostly done between us, back and forth emailing and staying on the computer, editing, compiling, uh, correcting, sending things back and forth, back and forth for oh, eight to 12 hours a day for six weeks solid in the heart of summer. Um, when I was hot and tired and ready to give up. <laughs> crazy, did you say crazy? <laughs> I, w I was really ready to give up, and I just thought, somebody else can do this, somebody else can get on the writer's back to get this information in. I just am tired, I, I just can't do it. And then I just picked up another essay, and it happened to be by Bob Wilson, um, Living on the Edge, which is uh, one of our introductory essays. And I read that essay, and I, it was the middle of the night, and I'm hot and tired, no air conditioning, and I read that essay, and I just burst into tears. And I just sat there and I said, this is incredible. This project is incredible and I just need to move on through it and just get it done. And we did. And amazingly enough, Mike and I are still friends, <laughs> but we do have a fabulous um, publication and I hope you all have copies of it and send it to everyone. It just, it's an amazing thing and I don't think any city in any country in the world could have come together to produce uh, this publication. And I think that most of it um, has to do with Mike's tenacity and, as you know, maybe his uh, aggravation <laughs> to many of you. But without him and his good works in this city, uh, this publication could not exist, nor could the city of Portland uh, uh, be in the standing of the most livable city in the world. Thank you.
as uh, someone who grew up in Beaverton when beavers truly shared the place with us, uh, I, and on behalf of the City Club, uh, appreciate your extraordinary commitment to Oregon's natural areas. Thank you. Uh, one of the most compelling comments in the book for me actually comes from Robin Cody, MJ's brother, when he says, we wrap ourselves in the River City myth, but measure our well-being in economic terms, which strikes at the question of what really is our identity as Portlanders and as Oregonians. And my question, in controlling uh, expansion of the urban growth boundary, some will argue that we necessarily infill existing neighborhoods, inflate housing costs, and deter business expansion, which then necessarily hinders our economic viability. Should we as Oregonians measure our well-being by this standard of economic health, or do we have an identity that's worth preserving that dictates a different standard? Is that directed to me? That's directed to whoever who wants to rant and rave the most. I can't get this mic any closer to me, so I don't know if, if uh, you can, can you hear all right? Um, well, I think we do have a different standard, and I think we're living that standard. And as I said, we, we have a, a unique land use planning program in the United States. There are others that are out there trying to emulate us now. And we have done a great job of containing urban sprawl. And contrary to what um, some members of our community would, would assert, there is absolutely no relationship or very little relationship between having an urban growth boundary and housing prices. If you look anywhere across the United States, uh, increased housing prices is a function of rapid growth, period. I mean, Houston is not my model for um, containing urban sprawl, and housing prices are skyrocketing in Houston and other cities. Um, I would say where we have gone astray, in my opinion, as I said earlier, is in not paying enough attention, which I believe we're reversing this, this, this uh, situation, to what goes on inside the urban growth boundary with quality of life. And part of that is, of course, protecting those special areas in Beaverton. One of my favorite sites is Creekside Marsh, which was to be filled back in 1984. It was subsequently allowed to be developed. Uh, they put one building on, on uh, pilings. Um, to retain the flood storage capacity of that well. And, and the spin-off story is that Mentor Graphics um, actually tried to emulate that environment in, in Wilsonville when they moved to Wilsonville. I have a favorite image that gets to the, to the heart of your question, though. It's a fisherman, only has a suit and a red tie on, standing in his boat in the middle of the Willamette River with a prone skyline behind him holding a 24-pound Chinook salmon. He's a stockbroker. He was on his way to work. This, this image ran on the front cover of the Oregonian in probably most papers in the United States. You tell me if White and Kennedy, you know, taking a year of thinking about how to, how to present uh, quality of life and economic development or economic wealth in the city of Portland and combining um, the economy and the environment. You could not come up with a, a more persuasive image, I don't think. So we have the opportunity, I think, and the ability to do exactly what you're describing, but we need to develop the political will and the, the grassroots support from city club and citizens to make sure that we move in that direction. Is this live? <laughs> I'm Kramer, city club member. Uh, the uh, planning for uh, wildlife and uh, uh, wildlife habitat areas in the city, uh, metropolitan area, uh, involves mostly humans and, and the wildlife have to kind of uh, go where they can, but some wildlife seem to adapt uh, more to us than we to them. And I'm just thinking of some of the recent publicity on Canada geese that uh, seem to uh, enjoy golf courses and uh, lawn areas near the river and so on. What, uh, what can we do or expect uh, on, on the planning of uh, the retraining of wildlife or whatever it may take? <laughs> Well, I actually would like to take, put a different spin on that. I think Bob, Bob Wilson, who is, I'm Bob Wilson, Bob Salinger, Bob Wilson is here today as well. Bob Salinger, who's director of our, of our Wildlife Care Center, has initiated a program that we call Living with Wildlife, and it gets uh, directly at the heart of your question. We do have a responsibility to figure out how we can coexist with wildlife in the city. After all, if we're producing habitat for them, they will come. And to that end, we're actually bringing uh, an expert on these issues, uh, John Hadidian from the Humane Society of the United States of America back in Washington, D.C., who has a lot of experience in these, these issues, to Portland on August 13th 
for a half-day workshop that Bob Salinger and I hope will initiate a regional discussion about how to coexist with, how to live with wildlife, how to address issues of Canada geese at Heron Lakes Golf Course and raccoons in backyards and so forth. And we have a lot to learn from other places in the country. Bob has done an incredible job here and in fact working with the city of Lake Oswego and other jurisdictions to kind of tone the rhetoric down with respect to coyotes, for example, and other predators, which has gotten totally out of control in the local media. And in fact, the media will be a target of this workshop, and we're hoping to engage them in the discussion so they can do a better job of educating the public. Great question. We need, a, we need to do a lot of work in that area. Josephine Pope, City Club member. Mike, you mentioned you had a few suggestions for uh, the Park Bureau. Uh, what are they? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> well, let's see. So I can be uh, quick here. I, wrote, I actually did write them down. There are areas like Mount Tabor, for example, that are both natural in, in nature and more of a cultural landscape. We need to develop a management plan process to establish management plans for those areas and for the natural areas. That's going to take money and resources. Um, we need to get a handle on I was in Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge the other day. There were at least 50 dogs that I watched go down there off leash. We have a major issue to deal with. And we need to establish some policies on off leash dogs in natural areas and recreational cycling with mountain bikes. We need to get a handle on non-native species, especially plants. And for, I think we really need to create a regional authority on controlling noxious weeds. And that's going to require some additional funding as well. And lastly, we need a volunteer stewardship program, which is going to require some resources. Just a few ideas off the top of my head. <laughs> As I said, this will be on our website at Audubon Society of Portland. You can access this for, for additional ideas later. First of all, what a wonderful combination of art and science you have produced together. Thank you for that. My question is, there has been much in the news recently, oh, I'm with Robin City Club members, excuse me. There's uh -huh. been much in the news recently about the Port of Portland and its role in protecting the environment. How would you uh, rate the port on environmental issues in the past, and what are the future issues for the port with respect to the environment? Yes. Thank you for, for asking that question. <laughs> But before I, before I address the question, I would like to go back to MJ and I are not the ones who created this. There are people, Florence Riddle, Bob Wilson, Bob Salinger, and others in this room, and as MJ mentioned, 60 others uh, in addition to other folks. Um, so this was a, a labor of love among a lot of folks, so I, I appreciate the, the kudos, but we'll spread it out to other folks. With respect to the Port of Portland, it's no secret that I have not been a big fan of the port's environmental policies over the years. Um, I, I will have to say, however, that I have seen a shift in the behavior at the port and even in how the Port Commission deals with the public on a, on a very fundamental level. I attended the hearing uh, for the establishment of criteria for hiring the, the new port director. The entire commission actually faced the audience, whereas in the past, anytime you would make a presentation, you would be looking at half the port commissioner's backs. That's a symbolic, but I think an important um, change in the Port Commission itself. And I think I've talked to Jay Waldron. I believe Jay has it on his agenda to establish a more environmental credibility within the Port of Portland. And I've seen evidence, certainly at the staff level. In fact, the field staff have done some amazing work um, out at Radio Tower site with respect to restoration. Tim Van Warmer, I like to point out, is doing great restoration work on port property on, on the Willamette River shoreline. So I'm hopeful. I'm cautiously optimistic. I actually, Bob Salinger and I will be making a presentation to the Port Commission on July 18th, I think it is, um, to give our views on where we think the port should move. Uh, Jim Zorn, City Club member. I want to ask both of you to address a question related to the quote that Brad read, I guess, of your brother, MJ, and that's the fact that we think of ourselves as River City and we live in this place, not only the city and the region, but the state that generally is so green. Uh, the same question that I asked uh, Commissioner Francis Williams here. How do we deal with the paradox that most of us kind of take for granted the greenness of this place, love it, mostly because it is so green, but yet, if we're going to really make progress in the historic way, Mike, that you've called for so properly, I think, to continue to invest in the good stuff, the good green stuff, especially in the community with what we're developing, 
how do we convince people to uh, vote yes when it comes time to allocate the funds? And you've both been here a long time and obviously care about these things and know about public relations and politics. How do we convince people to vote yes to invest long term for this stuff when their backyards are so green? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> how do you convince people? Um, it's a problem. I mean, we all know. We all know what we like, and we all know that we live in a green, green city, uh, in green, green environment. We can get out of the city in uh, within a half an hour and be in wilderness. Uh, how you convince people to keep that wilderness? I don't know. I don't have that answer. I don't know if Mike does either. Well, we've done it once, and we can do it again, in my opinion. Really? Um, we, we are living a myth, in my opinion. We have been living a myth. I think Robin is right on. That we have, a, you know, we are portrayed around the country, and we've come to believe that myth, that we have, in fact, been good stewards of our environment. Why, then, do we have 400 miles of streams inside the urban growth boundary underground? Why do we have 215 miles of streams that DEQ has de declared polluted? Well, the answer is very simple. We have not built our city in the proper manner that Olmsted, Mumford, and others have urged us to. Okay, is all lost? I think we still have the opportunity to turn that around. With respect to voting for, I, I think you were getting at money, at the bucks. We need the bucks to do this stuff. We did manage to pull off, of, I think, a phenomenal success in 95 in passing the regional bond measure. The city of Portland has passed bond measures. Um, Seattle just recently passed a $200 million bond measure. I think what will drive the public's interest in putting their, their money where their mouths or their sentiment or the myth is, is in their fear over what growth is going to do to this region. And I think that if people do have a, a clear understanding of with doubling the population or whatever will occur in the next 30 or 40 years, which is another topic that I will not get into today, which needs to be addressed, seriously, um, I think they will vote with their pocketbook, their checkbook, their credit card. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a campaign, a, 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 a uh, sustained effort, both at the local and regional level. I don't know. I have no other answers. And we need to, we need to get other funding sources, the, 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 the uh, gas tax. Forty percent or more of all the stormwater that runs into our streams comes from roads. The transportation system is not paying its fair share for water pollution and destruction of our streams, just surely from water, quali water quantity, not quality. Don Ebert, member since somewhere in the 80s. I mention that because it's because of you, Mike. This is my first City Club question. And that is, um, he was a wonderful student. But anyway, I have a question, and that is, what, what impact did Hudson's book, Green Mansions, have on you? How many, how many people in the room have read Green Mansions? Oh, excellent. Well, you'll, you'll understand why I was so taken in sixth grade, which I actually was living in outer southeast Portland in not exactly ideal um, home situation. And I had this incredible teacher that every day when I went into to class in sixth grade, he would read to us every day and had us all painting with oil paints and taking us to the Portland Art Museum for a Van Gogh exhibit. Those were things that, and I, and I was, I actually tried to find Mr. Ebert for a number of years and was unsuccessful because I thought he was in Portland schools. He was actually at, at Hector Campbell in, in the city of Milwaukee, as I recall. I ran into him, and I actually saw him across the room. I think I scared him because he was at an Eric Sten fundraiser, and I saw his name tag, Don Ebert. And I stopped at mid-sentence. I was talking to Bill Blosser, ran over to him and to tell him he was one of the most important people in my life. One of the reasons is reading Green Mansions and other books. Green Mansions struck me. Um, I don't think at that point in my life I was thinking in terms of, of tropical rainforest protection, but the notion of you know, that kind of environment. But even more importantly, and this gets back to the point Patty raised and I raised with the Coalition for a Little Future. The notion that we fear the other was in Green Mansions, and that even as a sixth grader, I could see that was wrong. So I think, frankly, over the years, I think I've tried to combine those, those two thoughts in terms of the environment that was described, but also people treating other people um, fairly, regardless of uh, what background they might have or what um, religion they may be or whatever. So that, it had 
a huge impact on, on my life. And I thank you very much for your having d provided that opportunity for all of us in sixth grade. Uh, Tom Dunn again, City Club member. Uh, Mike or, or uh, MJ, I wonder if you'd comment on uh, the role pleasant, presently played by the traditional wilderness organizations, uh, conservation organizations such as Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society. Uh, do they now play any role at all in trying to bring nature uh, back into the city? And should they? It's actually a really interesting question from my perspective because in 1982 when we, and I have to say that I am incredibly proud of my 30 years involvement with the Audubon Society of Portland. By the way, we now have 10,000 members making us the largest chapter in the country and we've got an incredible range of programs and we in fact work on both, in fact Linda Craig is one of the most renowned folks in the state of Oregon working on, who has worked on desert wilderness um, issues in the state of Oregon. Ruth Robbins, who's back there as well, has been involved in those issues. So we, we believe very strongly that we need to, to pay attention, and I, and I hope I didn't come across as saying we should be focusing all of our resources on urban issues. I, we need to do both, clearly. We have to integrate our efforts to protect wilderness areas, regardless of whether we go to them or not, and uh, nature in the city, wilderness in the city, if you will. Um, so there's a role for all of those organizations. In 1982, I will say that I took a little grief from some groups who felt we were wasting resources um, by focusing on wildlife habitat in the city, that we should be putting all of our resources into ancient forests, desert wilderness, and other issues. Those organizations, I, I, will, I will have to say, have turned around dramatically over the last four or five years and have actually instituted um, urban programs of their own or have spun off other programs that are focused on the urban environment. We need diversity of organization conservation efforts just as we need diversity of plants and animals and people. Hi, Jane Cease, um, City Club member. Yesterday at the um, City Club Research Board, we were looking at the um, sort of midterm draft of our report on Measure 7, trying to, <laughs> he's, he's rolling his eyes, uh, trying to um, uh, understand and explain it. And it occurs to me that um, if it continues to exist as the voters passed it, there might be some substantial dangers for the kinds of programs that you've been talking about, and I wonder if you might comment on those. So that's, that's the understatement of, of my life in Portland, I think. Virtually er everything I described that Metro is doing, the city of Portland is doing, and by the way, I, I per neglected to mention the the city of Portland has really turned around its attitudes as well and their new environmental zoning, river renaissance, uh, Mayor Katz devoted her entire state of the city speech to the Willamette. So the city of Portland is doing some pretty amazing stuff as well. I don't think I got to that. All of those programs are down the tubes, period. Forget it. Wrap it up. We'll be into talking about environmental education, whatever stewardship we can, and when we're, we're done as far as protecting the landscape either outside or inside the urban growth boundary. It's that simple. Already, I mean, even without Measure 7, it's been an incredible battle to get local jurisdictions to step up to actually implement regulatory programs to protect natural resources. Even, all you have to do is mention the word takings and, and I won't use the word cockroaches running, you know, when you turn the light on, but you know, you get the, you get the picture. Um, with Measure 7, all those programs are dead. And in fact, I'm co what I'm concerned about is any fix that the legislature and the governor comes up with, if there's any amount of compensation, we're, we're going to be, I think, very challenged to implement at least the natural resource elements of the land use planning program. People, I, I still don't, you know, it's, it's not politic to say people didn't know what they were voting for. I don't think people had a clue. I'm not supposed to say that. Everyone I've talked to who knows somebody else who voted for it thought that they were validating the constitutional takings clause, which is if you take somebody's property, you compensate them. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, 
And I'm, I'm frankly, Audubon Society is a member of a coalition that's looking at this issue. I will say no more because I've not been in that loop, but there, I'm very concerned. I believe there's a meeting today even to, to talk about the fix, and uh, it's, it's very worrisome. We have t time for one more question, and I propose to ask it. You both traveled far and wide, and I know that whenever you go to another city, you look at how they're attacking these very problems you've been talking about. What are the places where you've, you've really been encouraged by what you've seen? Are there, are there places that have taken refreshingly new approaches? I'll go first, and then MJ will chime in. Well, first of all, I'd like to start with East Bay Regional Park District in the Bay Area. You know, as I said, we're not the end-all and be-all. And in fact, we look to other regions to get our inf inspiration for the regional green spaces system. The first thing we did was take Jim Shalin and a bunch of other local park professionals and about 20 elected officials from throughout the region to the East Bay Regional Park District in the Bay Area. They've done, I think, the most phenomenal job, including us, across North America, maybe in the world, as far as uh, acquiring and managing natural areas. London, I mentioned Dr. David Good earlier. I think London's done a lot of excellent work. Unfortunately, they have an elected official back in office. Um, Red, Red Ken. Yeah, Red Ken, who, uh, who I think will probably assist David in getting back to the w good work the Greater London Council was doing before Margaret Thatcher killed it. Um, so London, um, you know, it's interesting to me around here in planning circles, people continuously refer to European cities as being our model. The, the Willamette, my favorite is the Willamette River should be the Seine. The Willamette River should be the Willamette River. The Seine is wonderful. I go to Paris when I want to <laughs> see the Seine. Um, the, the thing that's lacking in a lot of those cities is green inside the city. The beautiful thing about them, of course, is they're very compact, and so the the nature is very close at hand. So I, I, what I'm hoping we can do, which I believe we're moving in that direction, is incorporate the best of the urban design elements of European cities, but also integrate the green along with that. I, I want to say something about Seattle. Um, the Emerald City that I just heard maybe six months ago, <coughs> that uh, Seattle now has uh, as much green as Phoenix, Arizona from their overbuilding. And having lived in Seattle for many years in the 70s, it was a remarkably beautiful uh, green city. And I loved uh, all the access to the water uh, much more uh, water than we have here in uh, Portland, but now they have overbuilt and uh, concreted in most of their beautiful city. A, f a final plug, by the way. I've got two documents. I want to mention three. Portland Vision 2020, Homestead Master Plan for Portland Parks 1903. It's available at the Park Bureau for five bucks, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And Metro's Green Spaces Master Plan combination of those documents is some of the most inspirational reading I have ever engaged in, and I would really commend all three of those documents to those of you who are interested in these issues, along with Wild in the City, of course. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, MJ, and thank you, Mike, for an almost rant-free presentation. <laughs> Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to remind new, fr new members that um, we are having a, an orientation for them in the MAC lounge next door for a few minutes with uh, board members and staff. So if you'd like to join us there, we'll um, give you some orientation. Thank you very much, one and all. We're adjourned. Sure.